It was probably the most amazing experience I've ever had living with a tribe in Ethiopia for a week without any common language whatsoever. A tribe that knew nothing of money, uh, basically used salt for trade and they were practicing the most brilliant closed cycle system I've ever seen. In the wet season they would retreat onto the higher ground and live in semi-permanent dwellings there and as soon as the river stopped flowing and started to recede they'd come down into their summer huts uh, which they built fresh each year on the flood flats. Uh, the flood flats had been irrigated by nature, uh, fresh silt had been brought down the river, the old men would grow tobacco and uh, the young teenagers were sent away to the highlands with the goats to mind the goats because the goats would get sleeping sickness if they weren't taken to the highland and it struck me as a very good social method of getting pesky teenagers out of the hair of the tribe. They had to look after the goats. Um, but uh, it was a, a magnificent uh, cyclical system. In the early 80s we went over for Christmas with our cousins in Canberra and I was looking around to see what gifts other people had been given. My cousin Rob had been given a small book by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren called Permaculture One and as soon as he put it down I thought I'll sneak over and ask if I can have a look and I did. It was extraordinary. Here was a book that tied together all of those ideas we'd been having about a sustainable land use system with a complete philosophy, a set of principles, plant lists for self-reliant living. It was a, a complete revolution to me. There it was in our own backyard. We'd been all over the world and this book was sitting there in Australia all this time. After that fateful Christmas we heard that Bill Mollison was coming to South Australia to deliver a short course on permaculture, so we enrolled. We sat there for five days basically on the edge of our seats and, uh, and listened to Bill tell story after story and uh, provide lots of detailed techniques. He'd draw backwards with a bit of chalk and uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, we, we were just inspired and, and within a month or so of having done that course we'd completely designed the property. Permaculture is basically from permanent agriculture or permanent culture. So just shorthand for something that could last for thousands and thousands of years, a way of caring for the land. It's not really a system of gardening or a system of farming in the way of precisely how you work the plants and the soil. It, it affects all of those things, but it's more of a design system for both sustainable land use in the broadest sense. That could be everything from gardening to forestry and, and grazing and everything in between and sustainable living. So it's concerned with both the production side of the equation, how we provide human needs from nature, and also the consumption side of the equation, how we use those uh, resources and eventually the, the complete way we live. It's based unusually on three ethics. So it's a philosophy as well as a design system. And, and the three ethics are care of the planet, it's the only one we've got, better look after it. Secondly, care of community, if we can't get on with each other we'll ruin our own resources, we'll spend our time destroying each other. And finally, the really difficult ethic which is taking personal responsibility for population and consumption. In other words, if we all have huge families, uh, we're really going to put too much stress on the system and if as consumers we're gobbling up too many of the Earth's resources, again we're creating problems. We don't see these as unique to permaculture, but they are a reinterpretation of uh, basic ethical frameworks that can be seen in every traditional society on the planet. 
The strength of permaculture is that it's uh, applicable anywhere by anyone and that it's that personal overlay uh, in these design systems that al allow room for creativity, for things that are visually beautiful, but not just that, you know, have functional uh, elements to it as well. One of the things I remember seeing in a photo uh, shows that I was put to work early on the farm. Um, I'm in a nappy with a big straw hat on, holding a rake that's about five times my size and pretending to, uh, to work very hard in the garden. Travelling, studies, um, personal beliefs all sort of tied together beautifully uh, with the whole permaculture design system and the importance of looking after the planet but I think once we had children it became even more important to uh, make sure that the, the planet is being looked after and that we leave it as a vibrant place and a, a, an available place for our kids to, to live on. Some of the stronger memories are building cubby houses in piles of straw bales um, against mum's wishes and also a few of the, of the pets we had which were essentially feral cats that adopted the property and became semi-domestic. We had a little bit of an enterprise going on where mum would um, let us grow veggies and then sell them through her um, distributors so we could make a dollar a leek or a dollar a lettuce. Um, so I guess we had the space to do that. A lot of my friends who used to live in the suburbs um, didn't have that space to do that and so when they got to come here they'd love, love running around and playing games and would sort of be wowed by things like compost toilets and geese and betongs and that sort of thing. So yeah, it was a pretty good place to grow up. We retrofitted the old house to capture more light and uh, also to capture the sun's infrared radiation to create hot water. But really to create an effective living space we needed to build an extension onto the home which was heritage listed and so couldn't be interfered with too much. The extension was built from straw bales and stone. It was swung around so that it faced north. That meant that we could collect the solar radiation in the winter to warm the home. On overcast days, we simply light a fire in the slow combustion heater that warms the space and also our hot water. On the roof we have photovoltaic panels that produce green electricity. The house catches its own water and once it's been used goes through a septic tank and reed bed system that purifies the water so that it can be used to irrigate the orchard, so creating a closed cycle of nutrients. Immediately around the house we have the cubby house and the outdoor entertainment area. We decided to use geese for weed control on the block. That meant we needed a cat and fox proof fence. That in turn gave us the opportunity to be hosts to an endangered native species, a little micro kangaroo called the brush tail betong. It bred extremely successfully, enabling us to send betongs off to other sanctuaries around Australia. But there was a huge bonus in as much as the little betong had a habit of digging up oxalis bulbs, one of our worst weeds. It also buried seeds when it found them and whilst it was meant to remember to come and dig them up and eat them, many of those germinated and gave us a lot of new vegetation. So it's been a great species on the block. Climate change has had a range of consequences, um, one of which has been a steady warming of our winter and spring. This has had a marked effect on the flowering of a range of nut and fruit trees. They need a certain number of hours of chill in order to set their flowering. Uh, and when this is interfered with, the crop levels drop catastrophically, as happened with uh, cherries and pistachios over the last few years. For a while we'll be able to work around this problem by the use of shade cloth and sunscreen for plants. 
We've done a trial using finely ground limestone on walnuts which are very very susceptible to both low chill and also the intense heat of our summers now and this material reflects the harmful solar rays uh, during the summer and it also keeps the plants cooler during the winter so we're getting uh, double our money's worth. But in the end we will need to change the species we use to adapt to the changing climate. We found almost as soon as we started to develop the food forest as an idea that we were deluged by phone calls from people wanting to know how they could uh, set about sustainable practices. It got to the point where we simply couldn't get any work done, we were going crazy. So we decided to start uh, offering short courses on weekends and they became very popular. The food production of the uh, food forest is beyond the triple bottom line one. So it actually has an educational value as well, which is really hard to measure. But when we run our workshops, when we have our tours, for people to be able to taste, to see, to feel, you know, soil temperature, moisture in the soil, drip irrigation and so on, seeing is believing. So our vegetable and fruit production has a real environmental and educational value as well. We can educate and design our way out of the crisis facing human occupation of the planet and the key thing is for all of us to take personal responsibility about the way we run our lives and that starts with having a small family that consumes relatively little. We must also make environmentally sustainable ideas work. Things like farmers markets, green building codes, public transport, community gardens. These are structures that we need to treasure and make work. So in terms of um, making change on the scale that's needed, I think education is a key. And I think if that education can happen effectively, I don't see any reason not to be optimistic about the future. A lot of it is thinking about the way that people can cope with changes so that those changes aren't necessarily catastrophic. If you educate one person and then they educate two more people and then those people educate more people, then you've got this kind of exponential growth. We need to support organisations that educate and provide good policy and we need to strive for change publicly, both at a local and a global level.